Hello and welcome to the National Marine Sanctuaries with Exploring by the Sea Deer Pants live interaction. We are going to get started at exactly 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, so bear with us until then. Thanks for tuning in. All right, hello everybody and welcome again to the live interaction with National Marine Sanctuaries and Exploring by the Sea Deer Pants. I'm gonna give us a little bit of housekeeping and set the stage for this live interaction. We are going to have two different ways that you get to interact with our scientists today. And that is through Slido with Exploring by the Sea Deer Pants with Joe, he will explain that in the next few minutes. And there's also an interactive feature on this GoToWebinar. You can submit your questions uh, in the control panel in the questions tab. Uh, you can also submit questions in Slido, which I will let Joe go over. So with that, I will turn it over to Joe from Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. All right, well, thanks so much, Hannah. And hello, everyone. Welcome to today's live interaction with NOAA's Office of Marine National uh, sanctuaries or National Marine Sanctuaries. My name is Joe Grabowski from Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants and I'll be your host for today. So I just want to take a quick moment here uh, to share my screen. I want to introduce you uh, to Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants before we get started. So just bear with me uh, while I start that screen share. There we go. All right, so Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants uh, was founded in 2015. We run live events uh, for classrooms across North America and beyond, connecting them with virtual speakers from around the world, scientists, explorers, adventurers, and conservationists. Each month we run 30 to 50 of these live events. And during these challenging times, we're running three to four live events a day, broadcasting live into the homes of parents, educators, and students everywhere. So exploringbytheseat.com is the website. When you drop on the website, you can see there's a spot um, to share and sign up for the newsletter so you'll be kept up to date with all the new events and just a few events happening in the near future we've got a live event with pablo who studies penguins all over the world we've got virtual field trips to the sea turtle hospital in the florida keys sea horse feedings at the ripley's aquarium of canada and then world otter day is coming up and we're going to go live in costa rica to the toucan rescue ranch to meet their rescued uh, otter so lots of fun stuff coming up and we hope to see you joining in some of those events so Hannah did mention uh, Slido. So let me slide up a slide here for you. So there's several ways you can join Slido uh, and take part in the live poll. So there's polls, questions open right now. We'll have a few live quizzes during the event as well. The quicker you are and correct, of course, the more points you get. So a few ways to join. You can go to Slido. So sli.do will bring you to Slido and use the event code Stellwagen to join us. You can also use the direct link which if you look in the chat bar, I shared that direct link. You can just click on it or I have it up here on the slide. And if you have your phone handy, you can take part on your phone, scan that QR code in the corner uh, and we can get uh, you in that way. So lots of different ways to join. I'm gonna keep the slide up for a couple more seconds in case anybody's scanning or looking for a way to join the Slido room, but take part in the quizzes. They're a lot of fun to join in. All right, I'm gonna stop that screen share now. There we go. So uh, we are going to take a virtual field trip into the depths of Stellwagen Bank National Marine Sanctuary with expedition lead scientists. We're going to meet Kristen uh, and Calvin shortly. They explored marine life and shipwrecks in the depths of the sanctuary and are going to share some of the results of that expedition with us today. But before I do that, I'm going to throw things back to Hannah McDonald, Education Specialist with NOAA Office of National Marine Sanctuaries. Hey, Hannah. Hi, Joe. Thank you for the great introduction. And like he said, we are bringing on Dr. Meyer Kaiser and Dr. Myers from Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution today 
to discuss their expedition in Stellwagen Bank National Marine Sanctuary. Before we dive deeper into that, I'm going to go over our National Marine Sanctuary system. So our National Marine Sanctuary system encompasses over 600,000 square miles of marine waters. We protect 14 national marine sanctuaries and two marine national monuments. In the next coming slides, I'm going to take us on a little bit of a virtual tour all the way from the most northwest corner in continental U.S. to the Pacific, to the Florida Keys, and all the way to Stellwagen Bank, where, we'll, where we will be diving deeper today. But first, I want to start this off as interactive as possible. I want to know how many of you have heard of NOAA's Office of National Marine Sanctuaries before. So Joe, how are we pulling in? All right, taking a quick look in the Slido room. I see people have found it and are starting to vote, which is excellent. Uh, let's see, oh, 94%, 94% say they've heard of the uh, National Marine Sanctuaries. That is awesome. And just a reminder, the Slido link is still in the chat of this control panel. So if you are joining late or haven't found it yet, you can click directly on the link in the, in the chat. So to start our virtual tour, we're going to start in the most northwest corner of continental U.S. in Olympic Coast National Marine Sanctuary. So Olympic Coast protects out, um, out of the Strait of Juan de Fuca and into the Pacific Ocean. And it protects incredible tidal ecosystems to deep sea coral communities as well. Going further south, we have Greater Fairlands National Marine Sanctuary in California which borders Cordell Bank National Marine Sanctuary, also in California, and Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary, also in Northern California. So these three sanctuaries protect an abundance of marine life, like the 34 species that live in Monterey Bay, as marine mammal life, um, and including deep sea corals as well. So tons of biodiversity in these three sanctuaries in California. Moving further south, we have Channel Islands National Marine Sanctuary, where in this photo here, we have blue whales, the largest marine species traveling through Channel Islands National Marine Sanctuary. Going further west, we have Papahanao Mokuakea Marine National Monument in Hawaii, which is the largest marine conservation area in the world. We also have Hawaiian Islands Humpback Whale National Marine Sanctuary, which protects the breeding grounds for humpback whales. Going even further uh, into the Pacific, we have the National Marine Sanctuary of American Samoa, which protects the largest known coral head and the oldest known coral head in the world as well. So many incredible iconic resources are protected within the National Marine Sanctuary system. Going into the Gulf of Mexico, we have Flower Garden Banks National Marine Sanctuary, 100 miles off the coast of Texas. We have Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary, protecting the Florida Keys Reef Track. We have Gray's Reef National Marine Sanctuary, protecting a live bottom reef ecosystem off the coast of Georgia. We have Monitor National Marine Sanctuary off the coast of Northern or off the coast of North Carolina, and it's actually the very first National Marine Sanctuary established, and it protects the USS Monitor, a Civil War era shipwreck. And this one's quite exciting. This is our Mallows Bay Potomac River National Marine Sanctuary. It is the newest National Marine Sanctuary that was designated in 2019, just this last November. And it protects uh, the ghost fleet of shipwrecks. And here we have Stellweg and Bank National Marine Sanctuary. We're gonna learn a ton about what is below the surface of Stellweg and Bank National Marine Sanctuary today with Dr. Meyer Kaiser and Dr. Myers. We're also going to see this beautiful photo here of a humpback whale. So many people go whale watching in Massachusetts Bay and may have may be entering Stellwagen Bank National Marine Sanctuary. And over to the Great Lakes, our freshwater National Marine Sanctuary, Thunder Bay National Marine Sanctuary, where we've also run two live interactions with a research coordinator there. So those will be on uh, the recorded YouTube channel with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. So if you missed those live interactions, please check them out. They've been great to learn about Thunder Bay. 
And with that virtual tour, I want to know if any of you have visited a National Marine Sanctuary before. So you want to pop back over to Slido, which is again in the chat of this GoToWebinar. That would be great. And Joe, what are we pulling in at? Joe, I'm not sure if you are still muted. There we go. Uh, that question did not pop up in the deck today. So maybe if people answer that in the side question, in, this, in the question bar, and we'll take a quick look uh, and awesome. see if you answered that one. Oh, yes, we have, yes, yes. I see lots of people saying yes. And I see people that have visited Stellwagen. So that's great that they have a sense of place for the sanctuary we are going to dive deeper into today. Yeah, another one shouting out Channel Island. I'd say the yeses are well uh, overpowering uh, the no's. Very cool. That's great. We have a very lucky audience then. It's very nice to visit a National Marine Sanctuary. All right. And so I want to provide you a little bit more information of what the National Marine Sanctuary System actually does. So we protect things like the sea giants, the marine mammals, all the way down to the small sea life like reef fish and corals. We protect places with abundant biodiversity. We provide shelter for some of the most charismatic marine species like this Hawaiian monk seal and green sea turtle. We also protect maritime heritage like in Thunder Bay. We'll learn a little bit more about what we're talking about in Stellwagen Bank as well as the monitor. And we are mandated to do resource protection for the next generation. So with resource protection and within the National Marine Sanctuaries Act, we're mandated to also do education and outreach, which is super exciting to promote resource protection through programs like the one we're doing right now. So these, the National Marine Sanctuaries are also your special marine places. They're yours to paddle, to fish, to snorkel, to surf, to boat. These are your places for recreation and your places to enjoy. So I'm very excited that many of you have visited a National Marine Sanctuary before. So Joe, did this Slido question come up? Yep, that one's in there. in there. Awesome, so this is, I mentioned this once at the very beginning, how many square miles do National Marine Sanctuaries encompass? So this is a quiz question. Let's see who was paying attention. 58% went 600,000 square miles. Yeah, that is the correct answer. Great work. 60 or 600,000 square miles is the correct answer. All right. So, moving on to our into our presentation a little further. NOAA awarded in 2018 a grant for organizations who are interested in ocean exploration and could do so with telepresence. Now telepresence is the ability to bring the ship's work to shore. And for the SOAGAN project, we did that with education and outreach programs, bringing the work that they were doing on the ship, the exploration work right directly into classrooms and institutions. NOAA awarded this grant to three different organizations. The one we're working with today is Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, and marine imaging technologies. So this was a cooperative agreement amongst NOAA, the National Marine Sanctuary System, and Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. And with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and let Dr. Myers talk a little bit more about the project itself. And we have a Slido question that we're gonna ask in this transition. He might be able to read your mind. So the Slido question, Joe, is that one launched? It's loaded, it's ready. And the Slido question is, what is the first shipwreck that comes to your mind? I believe that's the question, right? Sounds about right. Awesome. Yeah, so hop into Slido, those tuning in, I can already see the answer starting to pop in. We'll give you a couple more seconds and we'll see just how good Calvin is at reading minds. We'll see what, uh, what he thinks is coming in. Um, okay, well, we've got 30, 30 plus results so far, and I am seeing a lot of one ship in particular. Calvin, I wonder if you me. can Don't let me let me see here. I printed out a, a picture, and I'm going to hold it up and see if this was your answer here as I do this. Is this the one, Joe? We are overwhelmingly getting uh, Titanic coming in, absolutely. 
Uh, but we are getting a few others sneaking in. We're getting uh, the Andrew Doria. We're oh, fantastic. Getting, uh, Edmund Fitzgerald, Chester Pauling, right. USS Arizona. So a few ones are sneaking in, but it's overwhelmingly, you did it, you pulled it off. <laughs> hey, you know, it's, um, it's interesting about shipwrecks uh, with Titanic um, and and Fitzgerald and Andrea Doria, technically they're not that old. It's just within the last hundred years and yet they capture our imagination. And so uh, there's reasons for that. And the stories that connect people to the sea of travel, of engagement, and then ultimately of, um, of tragedy and failure. And this is what a shipwreck entails. And so uh, I'm gonna try to share my screen here. Hopefully it goes pretty smoothly. You'll let me know first time going through this. So I ask patience, uh, but uh, show the screen and okay. And then I'll start my slideshow. Well, we start from the beginning. That's always a good place to start. So um, what I'm gonna talk about today is another shipwreck off Stellwagen Bank National Marine Sanctuary called the Portland. It was a passenger steamship. And this summer, or last summer, 2019, as Hannah mentioned, we received funding from uh, NOAA to uh, do a two-year project in Stellwagen Bank to explore, survey, and provide outreach through the telepresence of biological and cultural sites within the sanctuary system. And what you're seeing right here is a nice animation of the sanctuary established in 1992 as the 10th National Marine Sanctuary has over 800 square miles of protected bottom lands. Uh, that range is of course for natural resources as well as cultural I'm a maritime archeologists. So I focus very much on of course the cultural resources, but a scientific project is not a one person endeavor. And I think that it, we see this every day with, um, with science and research, it requires a team. And we had a fantastic team from Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution with uh, Kirsten, my colleague as the uh, lead PI of this project, but as well as with marine imaging technologies who really were able to get under the water. We'll see one of their underwater robots here in just a second. And of course, NOAA uh, and the total marine sanctuary system and the uh, national office as well were immensely supportive with staff and, and and just basically providing what we needed to go out there and document the site and for all of those collaborating partners of course we had even more from university of rhode island's inner space center to the fantastic crew of the rv connecticut which was our research vessel for one week and these guys i give my hats off to them they were fantastic and um, a lot of fun to be out on the water and doing what we do. But it's not just about you know, going out and, and being on the water, it's really what the research and what we're trying to accomplish. And, and last summer, our focus was on the steamship Portland. Portland was built uh, in 1889 in Maine, and it was a side wheel steamer, which means if you think of today's boats, all of their, the way they go forward through the water, uh, most of the time is with the propeller at the back end, but the propellers were actually paddles on the side of the boat on both sides. That's why it was called a side wheel. And it was a night boat. And this uh, industry was really luxurious. You could get on Boston, get on the boat in Boston, and then travel up to Maine overnight. You'd have dinner. You can stay in a luxurious stateroom. It's really a floating hotel, and it was a great way to travel, kind of precursor to modern um, airlines and shuttles back and forth. But unfortunately, on November 26, 1898, uh, a storm was sweeping up the Atlantic coast. Now, there were weather warnings, but it was very different than it is today. You didn't have, you didn't have TV, you didn't have social media, you had telegraphs. And the warnings came at certain times throughout the day. Well, the captain, Hollis Blanchard, who you see in the upper uh, left-hand corner of the picture, had a warning that a storm was coming up, but he had a job to do. He had to get his passengers and crew to their destination. He left Boston at 7 p.m. because he thought he could be ahead of the storm. What he didn't realize is that this storm was actually two storms. New England's famous for its perfect storms, and this was one of them. 1898, two low-pressure systems collided. 
and that catap uh, catapulted the storm even faster up the coast. And so you were having hurricane strength winds and blizzards and seas. In fact, the Portland Gale, as it became known for the shipwreck, destroyed over 200 ships up and down New England's coast and wiped out about 80% of shipping or 80% of shipwrecks came from that one storm. That's how powerful it was. And unfortunately for Portland, it was caught. We do know that it was still um, afloat at 11 p.m. based on eyewitness accounts of other boats coming into port. But sometimes through the night, it didn't make it. Um, and it sank, uh, and I'll talk about when we think it sank here in just a second, but all hands and all passengers were lost. And there were nearly 200 people on board who didn't survive. So it sinks and within a day, bodies start washing up on the shore, but no one knows where it is for the next hundred years. And they start to look um, as technology improved, trying to find and locate what becomes known as, interestingly enough, New England's Titanic. It becomes famous for the loss of, uh, of the ship as well as the passengers on board. In 1989, two, um, kind of just avocational uh, gentlemen who went out and looked for wrecks with side scan sonar, and you have pictures of that on the right, were looking for Portland uh, tirelessly. They'd go out every, every chance they could find. Um, and eventually they actually employed a scientist from Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution named Dr. Richard Lineburner to try to narrow down where this shipwreck could be and using prevailing currents and a very important piece of information. As I told you just a second ago, uh, the body started to wash up on shore uh, down current from where the wreck was. And, and people, when they looked at the bodies, they found their pocket watches. And it looked like the, all the clocks from the watches stopped at 9.30. Now, there wasn't an AM or PM on these watches. They were analog and, and you know, wind up. So, Dr. Leinberger had to calculate and then kind of work his way, reverse engineer back, and he correctly hypothesized that it was 9.30 a.m. And based on that information and the technology, they narrowed down a search area and they were able to find the location of the Portland. But what they couldn't do is identify it uh, officially because technology wasn't quite up to specs at the time. So it took the staff, uh, Ben Haskell, um, in 2002 to go out again with them with better technology and really uh, identify it with telltale um, shapes such as the funnels, the fan tail, and a walking beam that all identified the site. And these were all clues that pieced it together. And for, from 2002 to really 2010, Stowing and Bank went out every single year to document and to learn more about the site. Well, it had been a little while, since they were able to do that. And in 2019, we went back out with even more advanced technology. And what you're seeing right here is called the ROV Pixel. Now the ROV stands for Remotely Operated Vehicle. It's an underwater robot, an underwater drone. And this one's very special. It's developed by uh, leading engineers at Marine Imaging Technology. And what's great about it is it's portable. A lot of times these ROVs are, are very large and very heavy. And this little guy uh, is able to fit on the back of a, of a small boat and inside of it is a powerhouse engine of uh, cinema class, high definition underwater cameras that really provide HD imaging that you can show on documentaries or movies. But for us, we wanted to get what's called a photo mosaic. And I'll talk about that here in just a second. We wanted to create a 3D model of the Portland for the first time to actually bring it to you as it looks underwater. Now, I realize probably asking where does it sit in the sanctuary? Well, sanctuary doesn't give out locations to protect its site, but we can tell you it sits between um, you know, right in the depths of 400 to just over 500 feet of water. It is very deep. It's beyond recreational dive limits. So we need robots like uh, Pixel to go down and take a look at it. So for the first time, we're actually able to see 
how it looks in 3D. And so Hannah, um, I'm gonna turn it back to you because we have an animation that I'd like to um, show everybody. And I think it yeah. works better for your computer than mine. Yeah, I will uh, share my screen and show you that animation. So Kelvin, while I'm bringing up my screen, do you want to tell them a bit on how it was collected? The uh, actual imaging as we go through this? So yeah. uh, it, it, what's, what we want to do is we're in 500 feet of water. And as the pixel goes down, it has both side scan sonar to locate the site. And as we pop up, it's taking a running image both with photos and video to capture it. And as we swoop in, uh, this is kind of a, a, a draft of the rendering. We're looking at the bow of the ship. And this sits in 500 feet of water. And you can see, for an archaeologist, this is what we call a site map. And now we're swinging around to the uh, starboard side of it. You can see fishing nets that it exists. And this is what it looks like today. Um, well, at least when we view that. And as we zoom in, start looking for artifacts. This is what's great about being a maritime archaeologist. You're an underwater detective. So what clues and what things can you find as we go through? And I'm going to actually ask Hannah as we swoop back up to pause real quick. If you can. Yep, I'm going to go back to 40 seconds. Yeah, in about 40 seconds, there's... There is we go. Good or that's perfect. So um, I'd like everybody to kind of take a look and put on your underwater archaeology hats. And what you're looking at is a site map. And what is a site map? Well, it's a shipwreck. How can I best explain this? When you put together a shipwreck, you don't get to see everything at once when you're underwater because, well, you're underwater. And it's like looking through binoculars, but even, even smaller than that. So they're like little tiny jigsaw puzzles that we have to put together. And when we put it all together, that's called a site map. That's the full puzzle put together. And that's what you're looking at. And it allows us to um, complete the picture. It gives us context. What's context? Where artifacts are located and how they relate to each other, their association and position. And I'm curious, um, Joe, if anybody you know in their chat can just start pointing out things that they see. Um, if they look really closely, they can probably see some, um, you know, we call this a, a debris field or you know, disarticulated. This is all artifacts that have come off. And you might see a cup right in the foreground right there. It looks like a big kind of it's white and it sits right at the front. And this is actually a shaving mug where you could go in and uh, the barber in the salon could give you a nice shave, overnight shave, because these night boats also serve business um, class and business people who are going to business the next day. So you might want a nice shave on the way in or on the way out. And I, um, I don't know if you can take the cursor down to see that, but in the background, you'll see cups from the very last dinner. And these cups were um, you know, put away after the, uh, the passengers were done eating and this might have been the final you know maybe they had their uh after after dinner coffee after dinner tea some type of desserts that's the fun part about being archaeology and the responsibility is that we have these underwater clues and then in the lower right corner right there does anybody know what that is I mean, even if you hit run it might if you Play it again, Hannah. I think it pulls out a little bit. About a couple seconds further. So if anybody has a guess, put it in the side. Someone already guessed a fish. Yeah, uh, that's it. Okay, so we're zooming in. We'll zoom back out. There we go. Let's see this little guy. It's a redfish right there. Because shipwrecks are not just places of tragedy and trauma and, and loss of life. They're actually places that create life and the biology and organisms that grow and, and attach themselves to a uh, ship um, occur through time. And it's my great privilege to work as an interdisciplinary project with um, Kirsten, my colleague, who I think, um, Hannah, I think this will be a spot where I turn it over to you because she can definitely tell you much more about the life than I can. Yeah, I am going to turn it over to Dr. Meyer Kaiser. So Kirsten, right. you want to... Oh, sorry, I, I, I forgot. Uh, Joe, you were, I had a couple questions there at the end. I think you were cluing me in. I got ahead of myself there, but um, 
That's okay. 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 Yeah, those who are in the Slido room, jump into the quiz. We've got two multiple choice questions from uh, Kelvin's presentation. So we'll see who's on the ball. I'm going to start the quiz questions in a second. I'll just give people a chance to shift over and quickly pop their name into the quiz, which they're doing now. Good job, everybody. I'll give you five more seconds, then I'm going to start the quiz. So it is 20 seconds per question. Let us see who comes out on top. <laughs> And in, in the seconds. chat is the link to that model that we were just showing. It also includes an overview of the 2019 expedition and a preview of the 2020 expedition that will happen this summer. So if you want to check out that link after the recording is done, um, there's lots to explore. All right, that first question's up. I'm going to hit start. The quicker you answer and write, of course, the more points you get. So here we go. When did the Portland sink and with approximately how many people? Um, that's up there now. <laughs> I can see I made a little mistake in the question, so I think most people are going to get this one pretty quickly. But uh, let's see, a few people have been tricked. All right, so that one's done. We had the overall majority, 91%, went 1898 and almost 200. Let's jump to the second question now, if everybody's queued up and ready. Why are site plans like a 3D model of a shipwreck important to archaeologists? So do they show a complete picture of the wreck given context? Do they allow for a visual of all the marine life hanging around the wreck? Or do they just look cool? <laughs> got a few more seconds, five more seconds. All right, no fooling our people at home. 96% said it gives a, sh a complete picture of the wreck, giving some context. Let's see who came out on top here. Gina, two out of two in 13 seconds. Louise, two out of two in 14. And EL, two out of two in 15 seconds. Good job, everyone. Thanks for playing. And we've got more questions coming up as we throw things over to Kristen. Great. Thanks, Joe. So I'm going to show my screen here. And I want to start off with a, uh, a question, just kind of a brainstorm. I would like to know what kinds of animals do our viewers think live on shipwrecks? All right. So that word cloud is open uh, in Slido if you want to start popping in some answers for us. Uh, and let's see what people are thinking of. So they're starting to come in in real time. Clownfish, octopus, shrimp, anemones, coral, non-bony fish, sponges, whales. Oh, wow. Lots of answers coming in fast. Star, sea stars, eels. I would say overwhelmingly we're getting fish so far. Uh, but we're also getting invertebrates, a few sponges and corals coming up. Let's see if I can get a nice little word picture here so we can see it a little better. There we go. Yeah, overwhelmingly fish, but close behind is sharks, barnacles, corals, and anemones. Well, I'm really impressed by whoever said anemones and whoever said sponges, because those are the two most common things that we see on the Portland. So I am a biologist and I view shipwrecks as habitats. My research goals are to understand how the communities form on shipwrecks. How do those animals make it out there? How do they interact with each other? And how do their communities change over time? So I'd like to show some video highlights from our expedition last summer. So you can see for yourself what's living on the shipwreck. And that should be here, I'll play this video. So we're going to start on the port side of the wreck near the bow. This is close to the seafloor and you can see some of the archeological debris out there and there's two sponges right there in the foreground. So like I said, sponges and anemones are the most common things that we tend to see on the wrecks. As we pull up to the Portland, this is again on the bow on the port side, you'll see there's a, a large fishing net that has become entangled there. And it's colonized by organisms, though. You've got those anemones across the top. Those are the floats attached to the fishing net that pull it up into the water column. This is coming up the bow. And again, you see those yellow blobs. Those are a species of sponge that is pretty common. And then the pink things that you see along the edge of this net here, those are a thing called tunicates. Um, another common name for them is sea squirts. And they filter the water for their food. They like to live on the wrecks. You see an orange sea star over there on the right side of your screen. 
Again, a fishing net with some of those floats there. This is on the starboard side of the bow. The yellow blobs and the white cup shapes, those are both sponges. They're different species, different types of sponges. And coming up here in a second, you'll see the white flowery things. Those are anemones. They're actually a particular species of anemone. Um, they're called frilled or plumose anemones. The scientific name is Metridium senile. And um, that species is really special because it has been on every single shipwreck that I have had the chance to lay eyes on in the North Atlantic. I think of it as kind of a shipwreck specialist. It really thrives in these habitats. And you'll see more of them on the underside of this surface that we're looking at now. That's closer to the stern. So if we go over onto the middle of the wreck um, on kind of the top deck, oh, there's an Acadian redfish over there on the side. Those are actually pretty common. Um, they dominate the fish community this year. And this is the side paddle wheels. Again, you can see the yellow blobs and the white cup shapes are two different types of sponges. Orange sea star there again at the bottom. And so now we're pulling up to the middle of the wreck on the top. So Portland as a side paddle wheel steamer had a lot of mechanics going on on the top of the wreck. There was the walking beam, all sorts of things going on there. And those structures such as the walking beam on the top of the wreck are really densely colonized by anemones. And that's because anemones feed on particles and small organisms that live in the water as their food source. So they want to be as high off the bottom as possible to be exposed to really fast water currents that are going to bring their food sources to them. And uh, you can actually see the anemone's food source in the video. If you look on the left side in the sheen of the ROV's lights, you can see all of the small crustaceans that they feed on that are living there. And again, so this is some of the rigging on the ship and there's actually it looks like a wash basin in the middle there and you can see some of those yellow blob like sponges and the small crustaceans swimming around on the left side of your screen. So I think that looking at those shipwreck communities is just fascinating of what uh, is living on the wrecks. So I've described some of the patterns and we're going to pause for a quick quiz question, see who is listening. Um, so which of these statements describes the distribution of animals on the wreck the best? A, there are more, port, more animals on the starboard side than the port side. B, there are more fish near the bow than near the stern. C, there are more anemones on the walking beam than on lower parts of the wreck. Or D, the debris field on the wreck, around the wreck has the most animals. All right, so I'm giving our audience just a second to pop in, then I'm going to activate the question live in the Slido, but it's all there in the Slido as well, so you don't have to repeat for them. I'm going to give you three more seconds, those tuning in, to get into your quiz spot, and let's see who comes out on top. All right, here we go, going live. So, which statement describes the distribution of animals on the rack best? There are more animals in the starboard than the port. There are more fish near the bow than the stern. There are more anemones on the walking beam than the lower parts, or the debris field around the wreck has the most animals. Five more seconds. And it's looking like we have a sharp crew here today. 70% went with C, the anemones on the walking, more on the walking beam than on the lower parts of the wreck. Awesome. That is correct because shipwrecks are a really good habitat for suspension feeders that are feeding on particles or small animals in the water column for their food. Um, they're much bigger and uh, higher off the bottom than some of the natural boulder reefs. So that's a good place for those animals to live. And so one of the things that I love about studying shipwrecks is that I get to see how the organisms interact with the structure of the wreck. And I just love this photo. I think it's it illustrates that so well because this is one of the side paddle wheels from the Portland. And you can see that there are anemones on the top. Those are northern red anemones. And then you see those yellow blob-like sponges. You've got the white cup-like sponges. I love seeing how the organisms use the unique structures that the wreck provides as their habitat. Well, and I mentioned that uh, we're analyzing changes in the Portland biological community over time. So using the video recordings that we made last year and 
what we'll record this year, I'm able to compare that to previous investigations of the Portlands that took place between 2003 and 2009. And um, one of the things that I've noticed is that this species that I, you see here, this is another type of tunicate. The brown blobs all over this structure are individuals of that species. And you can maybe see them better if you look for the dark circles. Those are their siphons. So a siphon is where the animal is sucking in water and then shooting it back out in order to filter what's in the water for its food. And so there's been a really steep increase in the abundance of this tunicate species on the wreck over time. They're much more common um, in our recordings from last year than they were from the previous decade. So I think that's one marked change that has happened in the wreck community. And another one I pointed out, there were Acadian redfish on the wreck and those have come to really dominate the fish community. In 2003 to 2009, the fish community tended to have more cod and pollock in it, but uh, our recordings are showing many more Acadian redfish. They're really dominating the community now. And so it's really easy for me to observe and track those changes over time. It's harder to tell why they're happening. And so I'd like to ask another kind of brainstorming question. Why do you think those changes are happening? What kind of factors do you think might be driving changes in the Portland community over time? All right, I open that word poll up. Let's see what starts coming in via Slido. This is our last uh, Slido Adventure today. So let's see what we're thinking about driving those changes uh, in the Portland community over time. Let's see climate change, succession, uh, ocean warming, temperature changes, current um, fishing, new species. Let's take a look. I'm going to switch it over to the word view so I can see what's coming up nice and big. Okay, temperature and fishing are the number one. Uh, results coming in. That's great. Well, I want to give an extra 100 points to whoever said succession. Um, that's a word that not a lot of people know. Succession is how we, is the term that we use to describe changes in a community over time, which sometimes happen just because of the way the organisms interact with each other. It doesn't necessarily have to be driven by an environmental factor. But the hypotheses of climate change and fishing activity, those are really good things to be considering. So far, I haven't observed anything on the Portland that I can directly attribute to climate change. It's not like there's a whole bunch of warm water species that have shown up or a disappearance of things that have calcareous shells, you know, maybe as a result of ocean acidification. So far, there's nothing that I can directly ascribe to it, but those are hypotheses I'm going to be exploring as I continue through my analysis and reading a lot of other papers of what other people have found. For example, the shift in the fish community I know is something broader that's been happening in the Stellwagen area. So looking into other research studies that have happened is gonna help inform and help me figure out maybe some of those reasons that the community is changing. So thank you very much for listening about the biology and I will hand this back. All right, very cool. Well, Kevin, Kristen, thank you so much for taking us uh, on that deep journey to check out the Portland. And I mean, that 3D scan is pretty amazing and the life that's kind of taken that wreck over uh, is pretty cool as well. So thanks for sharing that with us today. So those viewing live, you can use the question bar on the right in your, um, in the GoToWebinar or I'm gonna watch the Slido room as well. There's a spot for questions to come in there. And the first one that came in and jumped at me was, uh, you talked about tunicates, and so a few people are wondering about what are tunicates. Oh, okay. So tunicates. <laughs> so um, think about the animal kingdom. There are 37 groups of animals in the animal kingdom. And tunicates, believe it or not, are in the same group, we call it a phylum, as us, as humans. So among invertebrates, tunicates are actually our closest living relative. Um, to the vertebrates. They're really cool. So a tunicate is a very simple animal as an adult. It's kind of just a blob of tissue. They're called tunicates because they have a thick um, outer layer of tissue called the tunic that protects them. And then inside, it looks like a basket. So 
they spend their lives sitting on a surface attached in one place. They suck water in and the water gets pushed through that basket so that the things they wanna eat get uh, hung up on the filter and then it squirts it out the other siphon. And so I find them to be really interesting. And in case you're wondering why something that's basically a basket surrounded by a blanket is related to vertebrates, it's because when they're larvae, when they have their really young forms, they actually have a notochord, they have a tail, they have something that looks like a head. And so those characteristics put them into the same group as us. All right, very cool. So we've got a question that came from a few people, but Rob is asking this question as well. This is for you, Kelvin. That hoop, people are dying to know in that image. What was that hoop? Someone wants to know, is it a hula hoop? What was that hoop? Do you yeah, know? It's not, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a really good question. It's um, uh, it's not a hula hoop. Uh, it's probably uh, one of these supporting um, braces that would be in various parts. It could be, uh, for example, supporting a funnel. You know, on a sailing vessel, you would have these running up and down the mass. With this one, uh, it's a great question. It's, uh, to be honest, and this is a part of archaeology, is sometimes we don't know. We have to see how it fits in with that other um, other component. It, it is coming out of the galley, so we do know it probably has something to do with uh, the galley manufacturing as well as uh, possibly supporting. But what I love too is sometimes I throw that back out to the bigger world because you have people who are always interested in different parts, and uh, you know sometimes. I've always been just pleasantly surprised when somebody will email me and like, oh, I know exactly what that is because we have a very similar thing that we use in our industry. And that's happened a lot. And that's some of those uh, eureka moments that occur in archaeology. So short answer is we're not exactly sure. We know do its association. It probably has to do with the galley and looks like some type of sort of supporting brace for um, you know, a basin of some kind. OK, so we've got a question coming in from Susan. Susan's wondering if there are any species of, of, of deep corals that can be seen on the Portland. There are not any species of deep corals that are living on the Portland. Um, I suspect there might be deep water coral species on other shipwrecks that you would find, um, for example, further south and a little deeper, like on the continental margins where deep water corals usually occur. We don't have any that are naturally occurring in Stellwagen Bank National Marine Sanctuary. So there aren't any deep water corals on the Portland. Okay, some uh, from watching the video, uh, Louise has a question about the nets that she saw. So, um, you know, there were several nets on the ship. Is that from a legal activity in the sanctuary or is some fishing permitted? Actually, the sanctuary is completely open to fishing. And so those are hangups, um, probably not intentional. Uh, but one of our missions is management and policy. And because we were able to show these nets and how they um, you know, are still occurring and in some parts have potentially caused even a little bit more damage, uh, we're able to work with the sanctuary staff to develop maybe even new policies that still allow fishing as well as protect um, the site and, and to have it there for future generations. So it's not just archeology span and biology, both of these disciplines come together to help shape policy within the sanctuary and to move forward and, and to give back to kind of that um, uh, modern day, you know, how does it affect us as a society as well? So all of these play into it. That's a great question. And, and we noticed a lot more nets when we went back out last summer than some of the older footage in 2009 and, and earlier. Okay, let's go for another biology question this time. We've got Ken joining us. Ken is wondering about how this wreck compares biologically to other wrecks, maybe like an older or a younger wreck. I love that question. <laughs> so it's actually kind of cool. We're, in addition to the Portland, we're studying um, another wreck that's two coal schooners that collided, and they're approximately the same age. So Portland sank in 1898, the coal schooner sank in 1902. And even comparing um, between those two wrecks that are approximately the same age, there are some differences. The coal schooner wreck tends to have a lot more sponges, whereas the Portland tends to have a lot more anemones. There's just some patchiness in the community. Um, I'm not able to say anything about um, older versus newer that are like right close to the Portland. One of the 
difficulties in analyzing shipwrecks is that they're all different ages, they're all in different places. Nobody, you know, does a purposeful experiment where, you know, they sink a whole bunch of wrecks in the same spot. But um, compared to younger wrecks in the sanctuary that are in different places that I've been able to analyze, the Portland is much more heavily colonized. So I think that there's an accumulation of those species over time. Okay, we've got another archaeology question from Amy, and this is, she's curious if any artifacts have been brought to the surface from the wreck. No, not not through any excavation. There are artifacts from the wreck, however, that um, uh, came almost immediately after the wrecking uh, that floated up. Uh, the currents, uh, as the ship sank, uh, much of the upper portions of superstructures were uh, were, it was violently blown off as air expanded, and of course you have the the lighter um, uh, pieces floating, actually down to Cape Cod, and so there is a museum with some of the artifacts. But uh, we, if we can, if we don't have to bring up an artifact, we like to leave it in what's called in situ, where it lies, uh, and keep it there as part of that authentic uh, moment in time. And we learn a lot about it where it rests as opposed to bringing it up but we do occasionally need to bring up diagnostic artifacts to help tell us a little bit more about a site with this one the history is pretty well known what we're really interested in is what happened in those moments and um, how it's affecting current um, contemporary sites like the fishing industry all right we've got another question here i'm going to grab one from the slido room and i'm going to deduce that this is from a middle school teacher because they're wondering what advice would you give middle school students who wanted to pursue fields like yours? So maybe biology and then archaeology. Well, step one from you know whatever age you're beginning, if you're starting at a middle school age, look for ways to get involved. Um, there are a number of citizen science programs or volunteer programs that allow students to gain experience um, in research. And then I would suggest focusing on science classes and trying to get a good education at college and potentially graduate school levels. Um, to become a biological researcher, I had to earn a PhD. And so putting a lot of effort into academics and into getting involved with uh, research programs throughout your education is really important. Um, what I like about archaeology, I kind of call it where science and history meet. You know, it's, it's this perfect amalgamation, especially maritime archaeology, of of curiosity of life. And so the first step is just you know, be curious and observe the world around you. The sea, we interact with the sea both on the water but also on land. So, you know, how do people, when you're down at the dock, how do they move about and how what kind of patterns? Because that's what they did 100 years ago. So just a natural curiosity of human behavior. But uh, with Kirsten, take every opportunity that you can, uh, especially for field work, getting out and doing, um, it doesn't have to be archeology. span It doesn't have to necessarily be in the field, in you know, the specialty. But if you're out there and you establish uh, hands-on practices, you, you'll get a sense of what you're really interested in. And what I found with the history aspect of it, I just really enjoyed that connection between uh, myself and the past, and I found archaeology with its material cult emphasis on material culture really a, a nice outlet to feel part of a bigger story than myself. So there's different ways to go about this, but I would say, you know, pay attention, be curious, and then take the opportunities as much as you can. All right, some great advice. So Hannah, this might be a question uh, that you might be able to jump in on. So this has come up a couple times in the chat and a couple times in the Slido. Um, you know, a lot of people saw those fishing nets and they're curious um, about the sanctuaries in general, like Stellwagen. Uh, fishing is permitted. What kind of uh, restrictions are in, in place in a place like uh, Stellwagen, whether it's fishing or, or other things? Great. Yeah, that's a great question. So 99% of marine sanctuary waters are open towards all for all types of commercial and recreation uses. That includes fishing. We do not mandate and regulate the fishing directly. We work with partners like uh, state fish and wildlife departments to manage those regulations. I'm not uh, particularly aware of the regulations that are in place in Stellwagen Bank National Marine Sanctuary, but it is not regulations that the National Marine Sanctuary System puts in place. 
All right. Uh, okay, this question is from Chris. And they're wondering about the material of, of the ship. How much does the material of the ship affect the progression of life that grows on it? So the Portland is wooden. Um, I've had the opportunity to compare that as a wooden wreck to some other metallic wrecks I had worked on in graduate school. Um, to be honest, I'm, I think the material influences it somewhat, but I think that the major influence on the community is more related to what larval forms. So larvae, you can think of them of Think of them as the caterpillars of the ocean. They're the early life history stages of those invertebrates that are carried and dispersed by ocean currents. And so it, in my opinion, has more to do with what larvae end up on a wreck than the material that's there. Um, Anti-fouling paints that are on ship hulls sometimes do have an effect. Um, there's one wreck in the sanctuary where it's all colonized on the top and then there's a hard line where the anti-fouling paint begins and there's no colonization after that, which I thought was pretty interesting. Um, and so yeah, some materials have an impact, but I think it's more related to just there's a hard object there. All right, so let's see if we can grab one more question from each spot. Um... Okay, so one more from the slide. Oh, this is from uh, Noah. And Noah was wondering on the expedition, did you see any sharks uh, with the ROV? Yes, we did. We saw a spiny dogfish. All right, very cool. Everybody loves the sharks. <laughs> uh, and let's see, let's grab one more question here. Um, Okay, so this is another question about the, the ROV and maybe Calvin, you know a little bit about uh, this. How long does, did it take for the ROV to get uh, that beautiful diagram? To, how, many, how many shots were involved? How long did it have to be under the water to get that beautiful uh, 3D image? So um, this is, I'm gonna give credit to our engine, uh, to our ROV pilot and also um, the people that put it together at Marine Imaging Technology with Evan Kovacs and Mike um, and Marianne. Uh, when we're actually down there, it would take to get enough footage probably um, was around eight to 10 hours of footage. Now that was spread out over a few days. And how that worked was just a running video, you know, the HD class cinema cameras were running pretty constantly as well as they were taking still photographs at a set time. So they were systematically working their way down with both stills and video. But really that time isn't just the field work. What we usually tend to say is there's a ratio of field work versus post-processing or after field work. And it's about three to one, meaning for every hour in the field, you have about three hours afterwards of post-processing. It really comes into that. So to do all of that, they they took all of that data, the, the video, running video, as well as the still photos, and started to stitch them together into this photo mosaic. And that takes a lot of practice and a lot of time. And, and so we're each day, you know, we're improving upon that model, and that's just a snapshot on where we were. But it's a, it's a kind of an incredible amount of data that they're really sifting through to bring that image to the public. And I like to say, you know, it's the first time that Portland's being, it's virtually being raised. It's kind of an underwater museum, and 500 feet below the surface now, we're opening it up as an exhibit to the general public. And so it's a, it's kind of a process in motion but they do a really good job over there. Very cool, I like that. Um, all right, well, before I pass things back to Hannah, I just wanna give a, a quick shout out to everybody who joined us today. Thank you for the great questions, both in the Slido uh, and in the chat bar. Thank you for playing along with us with the quizzes and the word polls. Always lots of fun to make things a little more interactive. And of course, Kristen and Calvin, thank you for two awesome presentations and a great Q&A session, but uh, I'm gonna pass things over to Hannah. Great, thank you, Joe. I'm just gonna do a few wrap-up slides. Uh, so I do wanna mention and highlight that all of our live interactions are recorded and they are hosted on Exploring by the Seed Your Pants YouTube channel. Uh, they will be up within a week of the live interaction. So far we have four recordings up in a playlist for NOAA's Ops of National Marine Sanctuaries. So if you were, loved this and are interested in learning more, we have some recordings available now. 
Uh, more upcoming live interactions. We are continuing this series for students with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants, um, which I will go further into our upcoming events in a second. We also have a National Marine Sanctuaries webinar series for educators. So if you're an educator learning, interested in learning more about sanctuaries and how to apply it to your classroom, that is a perfect series for you. Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants offers a great variety of ways to connect to scientists and explorers from around the world. So I want to plug them as well. And then NOAA Ocean Today hosts one webinar a month where they're doing deeper dives into ocean studies. So all of those are great live interactions to keep you entertained and connected to marine science. And here are our upcoming webinars with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. On Monday, we are going to do a tour of the marine mammals in National Marine Sanctuaries in partnership with Pacific Mammal Research. So that one will be a fun one to check out. We are going to be exploring the depths of National Marine Sanctuary of American Samoa on Wednesday. This is also a telepresence or ship to shore expedition that occurred last summer that we're going to be reviewing. And then we're also going to be reviewing the exploration that took place in Cordell Bank in Greater Fairlands National Marine Sanctuaries on May 27th. Both of these programs are going to be with sanctuary site staff and the organization that was doing the exploration was Ocean Exploration Trust aboard the Nautilus. So those will be fun programs as well. And following this webinar, you will be prompted to take a short survey. I recommend any adult who is willing to take the survey to enter your input. We greatly appreciate it and we use it to guide the development of our live programs. So if you have just a couple minutes to enter your information in after this is completed, that would be fantastic. And with that, I want to thank Kirsten and Kelvin and Joe so, so much for this great presentation. Very interactive. I know I learned a lot and um, I really hope you did too. Thank you so much for tuning in. And I hope you are able to catch an upcoming program. Thanks. Thanks yeah. Yep. yeah, this concludes today's webinar. Thank you, everybody.